join me in prayer, please. Father, this is your message. Every series, every message, every Sunday, every day, every breath is yours. We praise you and thank you for that, Lord. Pray that your truth is communicated through me this morning, Lord. I'm just a vessel. The message is yours, and we pray that you would convict us to do the word that you give us, God, to live out your truth to shine your light in this world, to reclaim our families and and identities and your children, whose we are, God. And all of that we pray an openness to learn this morning, Lord. So we yield to you, have thine own way, Lord, and we thank you that Christ abides in us and that we are led by his spirit as your children. And we pray all these things. Thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Greenwoods. It's a blessing to be here with you this morning. Today we're launching a brand new series called The Path. And uh, Andy Stanley has written a book called The Principle of the Path, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And some of that's going to come into play with this series, but uh, as the title slide says, it's based on Proverbs. So uh, we've just come off a big series Faith at Work, and in moving on to another series or the next thing, I didn't just want to leave behind everything we've learned about integrating faith and work and the work that God has for us. Now that we have a better understanding of work, now that we perhaps can begin to see how important our work is as God's people, I pray and begin to approach it with dignity. I want to build on that. So let's take what we learned about faith and work and now apply it to faith and life. Amen? I mean, you get what I'm saying? I mean, yes, we are to approach our workplace front lines with dignity, with excellence and innovation as God's people. But scripture tells us that we are to approach the rest of our lives as well with dignity, excellence, and innovation. So for example, Paul commissioned all of us in Colossians 3. He says, put your heart and soul into every activity that you do, as though you're doing it for the Lord himself and not merely for others. For we know that we will receive a reward and inheritance from the Lord as we serve the Lord Yahweh, the anointed one. So that's simply what we're going to be exploring in this series. The full title of the series is The Path, A Study in Proverbs. Proverbs is a great book to help us answer the question, how do I stay on the path through life as a child of God? It's a great book to help you answer that question. Proverbs falls into the wisdom category, wisdom literature, In ancient Israel, there were three groups of people who communicated to God's people on behalf of God, and that was the priests. They gave, literally, they gave the law, God's law. The prophets offered correction and direction. And finally, the sages gave counsel. So the book of Proverbs and its surrounding books, Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, those are books written by the sages. But scholars often refer to the three books of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes as wisdom. 
literature. Very, very simply, having intelligence or gaining knowledge means you know things, right? We hope we all know things. Having wisdom means you know what to do with what you know in various situations throughout life. Very simply, that's what wisdom is. So you can be smart without being wise, right? I have. Read the headlines. (laughs) It's sprinkled throughout our headlines. Wisdom literature was written to help all of us become wise, to help us know what to do in specific situations in life. The book of Proverbs was written primarily by King Solomon, purported to be one of the wisest men who ever lived. The Bible says this of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 4. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. So King Solomon was often referred to by the ancient Jewish people as the fountainhead or the father of wisdom. In today's society, he'd have a master's in literature, some sort of multi-recording contract deal for all his music and songs, various PhDs in philosophy and zoology, ornithology, herpetology, ichthyology, and some other ologies that I just did not have the time to look up. Pretty smart and wise man. Solomon died in 931 BC. So most of this book, most of Proverbs was written by then. But he didn't write all the Proverbs. We believe that he wrote chapters 1 through 24 but that chapters 25 to 29 were compiled 200 years later by men in the day of King Hezekiah. And we know that because Proverbs 25, verse 1, says these are more Proverbs of Solomon compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Chapter 30 was written by a man named Agur, son of Jaka, and 31 was written by King Lemuel. We have no idea who those men are. But we just know that they were very wise as well. Why? Because, well, if they're in the book of Proverbs, God's people held them in wise esteem. So we got the basics out of the way. Today we're focusing on Proverbs chapter 7, if you'd like to open up in your pew Bibles. Proverbs chapter 7. So as you start reading Pastor Andy Stanley's book, it's a great book. He says, this simple, profound truth about paths. He says, the road you're on determines where you'll end up. Very basic, right? But profound, really, I think. Many of us probably have stories and and testimonies about how this affirms that fact. But it's true, isn't it? I mean, if I take the Mass Pike to Springfield and then head north on 91, I will eventually end up in Canada. I will. But I want to go to the Cape. I got my boogie board. I got my towel, my suntan lotion. I've got my swim trunks, my beach tear, and a six-pack of Arnie Pommies. Great. Good for you. Don't take the Pike to Springfield to 91 North, because you will end up in Canada. Why? You'll end up in Canada, because that's the direction it heads, despite your intention to go to the Cape, despite your Arnie Pommies. So whatever road, whatever highway, whatever path, whatever path you choose, that will determine where you end up. I mean, that's the very simple point that Pastor Andy Stanley makes in this book. And we all know this, right? So here's our first principle of the path. Your direction, not your intention, determines your destination. That's that's a big one for me. I take feelings and emotions pretty, pretty seriously. Maybe some of us do as well. 
your direction, not your intentions, not how you feel, determines your destination. So as obvious as that is in the world of geography, in using our map apps, right? When it comes to the rest of our lives, our family life, our financial life, our marriage, our dating life, the way we raise our children, our physical fitness, our jobs, our professional life, our church life, the same principle applies. In every area of life, my direction, not my intentions, determines my destination. Yet, how many times have you been in a conversation with someone who's describing how his or her life got shanghaied or shipwrecked. Or the marriage fell apart. Or the kids grew up and became rebellious and resentful. Or the pink slip arrived in your cubicle at the office. How many times have you talked to students who didn't get the grades that they were hoping and worked for? Didn't make the team or the troop or didn't get the part they were hoping for in the play? or weren't even called or cast, right? And as they're describing what led to that failure, some of us might have said, well, didn't you account? Didn't you account for that possibility? Didn't you prepare for that in any way? What about your plan B? You you know, the truth is, many of us, many of us don't have a plan B. I mean, I've shared this before in the fourth grade. The theater bug bit me, and it bit me hard. There was no plan B for me at all. It wasn't even a thought. There was no plan B. Acting and theater were it, period. That's what I, that's what I was going to do. And after high school musicals and a BFA in drama and music and six years of scrambling in, in the Big Apple to try and make it work as an actor, it, it, it hit me. And and it hit me hard. The only career I wanted and envisioned was actually not going to work out. So Micheline and I left New York City, and it was the first of two major deep depressions in my life. There was no plan B for me. So... What is Pastor Andy saying in this first principle? You can have the best of intentions, right? You can want it with every fiber in your body. But you can still end up in the worst of situations. That can happen to you. It can happen to me, to anyone. And, And even if you're the smartest person on the planet, again, read the headlines. Or the best looking, or the biggest, or the strongest or the one with the most degrees and letters after your name on your business card. Maybe you need two business cards for all the letters after your name. I don't. But when it comes to every area of life, your direction, not your intentions, not your strengths, not your weaknesses, not your hopes, not your dreams, your direction will determine your destination. The path you take will determine where you end up. So in Proverbs 7, King Solomon tells a story. You know, we don't know whether it's true or not, but he shares it to demonstrate the principle that we're talking about. We're starting in verse 6, Proverbs 7, verse 6. At the window of my house, Solomon says, I looked out through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who lacked judgment. Can you start to see something's coming here? Trouble, 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 trouble. Verse 8. Uh, He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar at this point to anticipate where this story is heading, do you? A young guy cruising the streets at sunset, heading in the direction of a specific woman's home, as we will see in just a moment. He knew who this woman was, and he knew that she was married. And apparently, he even knew that her husband was out of town and that she would be prowling the street corner looking for, well, just looking, and sometimes that can be more than enough. Amen. That alone should have stopped him in his tracks, but it didn't. In fact, that was the very reason he was headed in her direction in the first place. So back at the window, Solomon was watching this young man 
And there's a direct contrast between where this kid thought he was heading and where Solomon knew he was actually heading. Why? Because the older, the wiser man understood from experience where that path would lead. The adolescent was preoccupied with what he believed would be an exciting event, right? Compartmentalized, an isolated night of passion, a night disconnected from any other event in life. But Solomon knew better. This night was not going to be an isolated event, disconnected from all the other events in this young man's life. This night was another step on a destructive path, a path like all paths that leads towards something. All paths lead somewhere. This particular path had a predictable destination, but you don't need to be the wisest man in the world to know that. Any of us could predict the outcome of this encounter with nothing to draw on but our own life experience or the experience of someone we know who embarked on a similar painful path. Funny how that works, right? What's so obvious to those watching and warning often escapes us in the moment when we don't see the destructive paths we're on. That's, again, I've been there. Maybe some of us have too. The story continues in verse 10. Then out came a woman to meet him dressed like a prostitute. Solomon doesn't really hold back with crafty intent. She is loud and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him, and with a brazen face she said, I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I have fulfilled my vows. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you, and I have found you. So when this woman said she had fellowship offerings at home, she was essentially saying, look, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm not a prostitute. I have plenty of money at home. I'm not after your money. I just want you. She was also implying that she'd been to the temple, had everything squared away with her God. So having already taken her sin bucket and dumped it at the altar, she's ready to fill it up again with him. Verse 16. I've covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I've perfumed my body with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. She goes on, and she's also very clear at this point, as if she wasn't clear enough. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. Well, that pretty much clinched the deal in uh, this young man's mind. Not only did he not have to worry about her husband catching them, but he could hang out for breakfast the next morning, right? Watch a little TV, maybe even spend the entire weekend. This just seemed to be getting better and better from his perspective, right? But Solomon saw this situation in an entirely different light. Let's hear what he has to say. Verse 21, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once, he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Whew. Wow. Solomon's clear about what he sees. So from his vantage point, Solomon knew that this young man was just throwing away his future and the future of his family and friends. He was on a path that led to destruction, despair, maybe even death. Solomon's pretty clear about that, right? So there's something we need to remember when reading the Bible. All right, let's just step back for a moment from this account. Yes, we're presented with stories and parables, historical figures, eyewitness accounts, and so on. This Bible has many genres in it. As I've said before, you'd find it in almost every section of a library if this was the only book in that library. It would fill all those sections. So despite the stories, parables, historical figures, eyewitness accounts, it's really easy to judge these people, isn't it? I catch myself doing it. Oh man, Adam, come on, Eve. Don't listen to that snake. Wow. Man, if I were in the garden, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I've said that. And friends, 
we need to be careful. The amazing, I'm saying this to myself too. The amazing thing about our Bibles is we read these stories, we read these accounts, and then it's like a spiritual mirror is held up. Do you feel that when you read this book? It's continually held up. And as we continue to read scripture, God continues to hold up that mirror to us. It's as if he's asking us, what would you have done, my child? Don't be so hasty in your judgment of of Adam, Eve, King David, Peter. Satan is called the great deceiver, the father of lies, the ancient serpent for a reason, my child. He's been at this for a very long time, and he's very good at what he does. Don't be so hasty to judge. That's what God says to us. So at this point in Solomon's narrative, he holds up the mirror for all of us, to us, right in front of us. Solomon is now addressing you and me in verse 24. Now then, my children, look to me. Look in that mirror. Look to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. The disconnect in Solomon's scenario is easy for us to see on the outside, right? The outside looking in. But what if it's us? What if we're that young man? You fill in the blanks of what scenario it is, financial, uh, uh, an unwise financial situation. Maybe you responded to the wrong opportunity in a job. But when it's us on the inside, in the midst of deception and enticement, facing a path that looks in the moment pretty good, it's hard for us in those moments to step back and to see the red flags, to listen to our loved ones waving frantically, trying to tell us, stop, don't you see the danger? Stop. It's hard for us to look into that mirror that God continually holds up to us, to hear him asking, Don't you see where this path leads, my child? Do you really want to go in that direction? So why is it that we humans have a propensity or an inclination, a habit even, for choosing paths that lead us where we don't want to go, where we didn't intend to go? There seems to be a disconnect, a lapse in logic and reason, right? Well, I'm hoping we can talk about this in this series. Can any of us relate to some of these situations? A single woman says, I want to meet and one day marry a great Christian guy who's really got his act together, but then she dates whoever asks her out as long as he's cute. She's swiping the dating app in the wrong direction. A single guy says, I want a great sex life once I'm married, but then he continues to practice with every girl he dates along the way. The married woman says, I want to have a great relationship with my husband, but continually prioritizes the children over him. A husband says, I want my kids to respect me as they grow up, and then he openly flirts with other women in the neighborhood. A young Christian says, I want to develop a deep and lasting intimacy with God, but instead, rather than getting up and reading the word, he gets up and reads the morning newspaper religiously every morning. An employee of a firm says, I want to grow old and invest in the latter years of my life, I want to invest in my grandchildren, but continually neglects his or her health. Supersize it. A couple says, we'd like our children to develop a personal relationship with God and and choose friends who have done the same. That's my prayer for, for my girls. But they continue to skip church every weekend, every other weekend, head to the beach or watch the Sunday game or sleep in. Newlyweds determined to be financially secure by the time they reach their parents' age, but instead adopt a lifestyle, many of us have done this, sustained by debt and leveraged assets. A high school freshman intends to graduate with a GPA that will afford him or her options of stellar colleges, but studies are habitually neglected. And the list goes on and on. Many of us have been on that list. I have. Many of us may, might be on that list right now, but the point is, the people on that list and all of us who at some point have been on that list 
have legitimate goals. And oftentimes, every good intention of reaching and achieving those goals. But like the naive young man in Solomon's proverb, the paths they choose eventually bring them to a destination entirely different from the one they intended. How did I end up here? Friends, this isn't rocket science, right? We shouldn't need someone to connect the dots for us. I mean, if your goal is to drop two dress sizes, for me to drop a shirt size, you don't have to eat lunch at Mickey D's. (laughs) It's not rocket science, right? And I know I'm oversimplifying in some of these things we face with on a daily basis family history and emotional health and all of that, of course, are taken into account. I don't mean to oversimplify, but there are choices that we can make, little choices, to move in a better direction. Maybe to get off of the destructive path and see if we can pray and find our way to the path that God has for us. If you desire to remain faithful to your spouse, don't linger in that online chat room with members of the opposite sex, right? Don't click on that flashing ad on the web page. Those aren't pastimes, those are pathways, friends, and I hope we see that. They lead somewhere. As I've already said, it's much easier to see these dynamics at work in other people than in ourselves. That's something else. It's easy to judge. It's easy to admonish. And in fact, right now, maybe some of us are thinking about several people who we wish were here this morning to just open up the conversation about this, to talk about it. But before we start putting names to faces in our minds, let's take a minute and think about our own lives, okay? I'm asking myself these questions too. Are there disconnects in your life? Are there discrepancies between what you desire in your heart and what you're doing with your life? Is there alignment between your intentions and your direction? Simple questions. If you ever have gotten lost while driving, Micheline, has a few stories there with me at the wheel. Right? Amen. Please, I'm not alone in this, right? Many of us have gotten lost while driving. And, and we know this. If you backtrack far enough, you can eventually get your bearings and be on your way. Right? Worst case, you've wasted a few minutes, maybe an hour, maybe two. Micheline has some stories. But we eventually ended up on the right direction. We were on our way. But when you get lost in life, it's hard to backtrack, isn't it? There's no cosmic voice to assure you that it's recalculating. Wish there was. Recalculating your destination. When you get lost in life, you don't waste minutes or even hours, you can waste an entire season of your life. That's the tragedy. Choosing the wrong path in life will cost you, can cost you, can cost us precious years. No one wants that. No one wants to wake up in their 50s and and wish they had taken a different path in their 30s. Maybe I would have ended up in a different, better place than where I am now. No one wants to arrive at the end of a marriage and wish she had taken a different path during her dating years. I mean, just think about it. You only get to be 20 once. You only get to be 30 once in the list, 40, 50 once. You get one senior year. You get one first marriage. The path we choose at those critical junctions doesn't just determine our destination the following year but for the following seasons of our lives. The principle of the path is operating in our life every minute of every day. We are currently on a financial path of some kind. Each of us is on a relational path. We're continuing down a moral path or an ethical path, a spiritual path, and it leads somewhere. It's going and it's headed in a direction. 
So here's the $64,000 question. Why would a guy like the one in Solomon's story walk down such a path? How come he doesn't see what's coming? Well, answer, and Solomon spelled it out for us at the beginning of the account, he doesn't think it's a path. He thinks it's an event, an isolated one-time occurrence. When the truth is, wisdom would tell us, God says your life and its destination aren't about anything immediate. Life, rather, is about the ultimate, the blessed, the eternal. Amen? You can't outmaneuver or overcome the principle of the path with good intentions. Your direction, not your intentions, determines your destination. Some of us have been brokenhearted at various times in our lives. I have, and we've wanted to know, why did God let this happen to me? And the hard answer, but the truth is, he didn't let it happen. He wanted to stop it, but he couldn't stop us. It's free will. So this leads to two questions that I just placed before you. In what direction are you headed today, morally, relationally, financially, spiritually? These are the biggies, right? We could probe into many more areas. I can't answer these for you. Only only you can. You might want to assess this with others. I would encourage that. Others you trust. You know, we should be talking about this with each other. Amen? I mean, we need to be sharing life. We need to be willing to care and love each other enough to check in with questions like this. You know, I encourage all of us to take some time, maybe even tonight before we go to bed, and to just think about this. Talk about it with your spouse or your your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your parents, your dorm mates, people who are like-minded and people that you trust, people that you feel God has placed in your life to hold you accountable to some of these questions. Pray about it together. Next question, how do you learn to choose the right path? I'll offer a few answers. But again, we have to be the ones to implement these. We have to choose these. One, number one, pursue wisdom. You know, that's what we're going to be doing in this series for the next few weeks. Begin by pursuing God's wisdom from Solomon and the book of Proverbs. We can ask for that wisdom. Reading Proverbs will increase our wisdom quota. I guarantee it. You know, that there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Read one a day. Make it a daily devotion. And that's what Billy Graham did every single day of his life. He read a proverb a day. He devoted time each day to read a chapter of Proverbs. So pursue wisdom. Share life. Number two, we need each other. That's how God designed us and wired us for community. What if this guy in the story had a friend looking out his window or her window instead of a man he had no relationship with? He didn't know Solomon. What if his friend had run down the stairs and warned him and and rescued him before he ever got to the woman's house? Where was his family? Where was his friends in this story, right? Why wasn't he helped to choose a better path? His whole life would have been different. Here are a couple of questions that all of us should be asking, especially in those difficult, tempting situations. Who do I have in my life who can warn me from danger? And would I be willing to let my group of friends from church or from the dorm room or wherever, or my family, would I let them do what I'm about to do? Would I interject and say something and warn them? We're better together, friends. We need each other. Share life. Just do it. Nike, right? Number three, make choices based on the long term rather than the short term. You know, in other words, maintain a God perspective. That seems to be a theme in all these sermon series that we're learning from. Maintain a God perspective. See your life uh, the way we see your life. As your friends, as your community, Think of your life like a a path, a series of steps, not a bunch of disconnected, unrelated events. So when you reach the fork in the road, anytime I can incorporate the Muppets, 
Long live, well, no, I won't say that. So when you reach the fork in the road, stop and consider this. And you'll see this, I've given you, you can put this on your fridge or fold it up in your purse or in your car. Just a little reminder. That's what this reminder is for. Every decision is a fork that will lead you down one path or another. So which fork will you take? For the next several weeks of the series, I, I, I hope you'll remember this fork to remind you of just that. You'll see this insert in your bulletins, and I pray that we pull it out every now and then. Every decision I make is a new fork in the road. Every decision I make takes me down a new path. Is that the path you want to go? Is that the fork you want to choose? So the prayer, Lord, help me to choose the right path when I'm faced with the fork in the road. Hope that helps us. Next week, we're going to talk about what to do if we find ourselves on the wrong path. I encourage you to come to this series. All of us need to hear this. We'll learn a prayer that will help us recalculate, right? Maybe we can recalculate ourselves with God's help and head in the right direction. I hope you'll come back next Sunday. If you decide that you're going to change paths or, or make a course correction, Reality tells us that we'll probably encounter some challenges as well when we do that. So I wanna, I wanna pray for us. I, I pray that we learn as we pursue the new and better path that Jesus paves before us. The momentum we build up on this new path will not only help us, but it will help a lot of people that we really care about as well. Let's pray. Father, the path that we choose in life, Lord, should be a closer step towards You. And in the moment, Lord, as we've talked about this morning, Lord, in the moment, we, we may not see that, that we in fact may be moving away from You with every step. And Lord, as You continually tell us, He's called the great deceiver for a reason. There have been many times in, in my life where I've been deceived by the enemy, Lord, and in the moment we feel like we're getting closer to you when in fact if we had just stepped back and listened to our friends, our family, we would have seen that that was a destructive path, Lord. But thank you and we praise you that no matter how far on a destructive path we get, Lord, in your eyes there is no point of no return. Praise you for that. There is no no withheld opportunity of forgiveness in you and love. You just look on us with love no matter where we are and meet us where we are. We've never strayed too far from you when the reality is you're right there with us. So I pray, Lord, for clear thinking and clear vision as we choose your path, Lord, I pray that we would, as a community, as Greenwoods, share life in a loving and gentle way, Lord. Maybe some of us need to be asked some of these questions. I pray that we care enough to do so for your sake. So we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this series. We thank you for all you're doing at Greenwoods and pray that your wisdom would bubble up and increase our wisdom quota in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits, and that we would just strive on the path that leads to you, Lord. We love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, empowered by your spirit, we pray in his name. The church said, amen.